Good afternoon and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's latest webinar, uh, this one on attracting birds to your backyard. We're very fortunate today to be joined by Sarah Murphy from Armstrong Bird Food. Uh, Sarah's going to have a lot of interesting tips and tricks to get more birds to your backyard, to your backyard feeders. Uh, of course, we want to say thank you to Armstrong, not just for this webinar, but for their ongoing support for our birding and uh, environmental programs at Riverwood. Uh, now that Riverwood, the park has now reopened in terms of the parking lot, uh, trails have always been open. Uh, the Armstrong bird track is, of course, accessible uh, to people for guided walks as they make their way through the park. Of course, if you are heading to Riverwood any time the next little while, uh, physical distancing rules are still in place. Uh, so please keep that in mind as you go out and explore nature safely. And if you have the financial means uh, to support us as we deal with the challenges of COVID-19, of course, your support is always very much appreciated. You can make a donation at theriverwoodconservancy.org. So we'll just give it a couple more seconds for a few more of our panelists or three more of our attendees to join in. And again, thank you so much for being with us uh, on this afternoon. Uh, and if you have questions for Sarah, we'll get to a Q&A segment uh, just after her presentation. So any questions that you may have throughout the course of the presentation, just dro drop them into the Q&A panel in Zoom and we'll get to those questions shortly. And I will turn things over now to Sarah Murphy, who is Armstrong Bird Foods brand manager, uh, overseeing marketing and product development for the Armstrong brand. Uh, she's worked in sales and marketing in wild bird food for over five years and has attended Queen's School of Business for undergraduate studies before working for Armstrong and she's located in southern Ontario, born and raised in the Hammer, Hamilton. Uh, she loves spending time outdoors, going for walks, gardening, and of course, as you'd expect, watching bird, bird feeders. Uh, I don't know what more qualifications you need at this point. So Sarah, I will turn things over to you and uh, we'll take your questions uh, from the audience a little bit after uh, the presentation is done. Sounds good. Thank you, Rasheed. And uh, hello, everyone. I know I can't see you at the moment, but I trust that you're there. Uh, or maybe watching this video later on after it's been recorded. Uh, welcome. As Rashid mentioned, I am Sarah and I work for Armstrong Bird Food and maybe you have heard of us before or seen our products before. We are a Canadian-based bird food manufacturer. Uh, we actually are located in southern Ontario, just a little bit south of Hamilton along Lake Erie, and we manufacture bird food products that are found coast to coast in stores all across Canada. And as Rashid mentioned, we're very proud partners of the Riverwood Conservancy, and we've been for the last couple of years. So because of COVID and, and people working from home and spending more time online, this opportunity came up to do some webinars and to talk about bird feeding and how you can attract birds to your own backyard in the conservation area, but in the privacy of your own home. So that's what we're here to talk about today. And as Rashid mentioned, if you have questions and that's what's brought you here, please feel free to write them and we'll have some opportunity at the end to go through them. But basically what I'm going to do is walk through a presentation that has a few different topics that I thought would be important to cover. And my part will probably take about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and then at the end, we'll do the question and answer. Um, but really this presentation is for a wide range of demographics. If you are someone who has never fed the birds before, has never really done much bird watching, you're gonna get a lot of really useful information and tips and tricks from this presentation. But at the same time, if you're at the other end of the spectrum and you actually have dabbled in bird feeding for a few years, you have experienced bird watching, I really hope that you will actually glean some really important information and some useful tips and tricks to try to make your hobby uh, more successful and more efficient for you. And um, so I really hope that anyone from any end of the spectrum is going to get something out of this presentation. So where we want to start off, I thought it'd actually be very important to start at the beginning about what really is bird feeding and bird watching and why is it an important hobby and why is it a really interesting hobby. And then I wanted to get into what exactly are the birds that you can see in Canada and especially if you are from Mississauga or the GTA, what are some of the really beautiful Canadian birds that are close to home that you have a really good chance of finding in your backyard. And then from there, the meat and the potatoes is what are five steps or what are five practices that you can do to try to bring birds closer to your home into your backyard. And so I'm going to walk you through some of those five steps that I would recommend. And then we're going to finish off with Q&A. So I really wanted to start here with just asking the question of why birds? Why bird watching? Why bird feeding? Really, why are you even here today watching this video? And there was a survey that was done a couple years ago in Canada and the USA 
that try to figure that question out. They actually asked people who feed the birds, why do you do it? And there was four reasons that came to the top of the pile. Beauty, peace, independence, and connection. And so I thought this would be a very interesting place to start the presentation. And if, you, if we all just want to take a couple seconds and really think about why do we care about birds? Why are we watching this video today? And maybe you relate to all four, or maybe you only relate to a couple. But I thought it'd be very interesting to think about. So on the beauty side, in a sense, this is kind of one of the most obvious ones. I mean, look at that beautiful blue jay that's there on the screen. A lot of people attract birds because they want to have a home and a yard that's really attractive. And so just like why they garden and they landscape and they put out decorations outside, people want a bird feeder because they want to attract really beautiful birds because they view it almost as a landscaping feature. For other people, one of the main reasons why they like to watch birds and feed birds is because it brings peace to their life. We all experience stress with work and with technology and being able to connect with nature by seeing it outside, out your window, in your backyard. It just really helps you unwind. It helps your mental health. And so a lot of people feed birds for the peace that it brings. The third reason is independence. So some people really like it because you really feel like you are a handy do-it-yourselfer who's built this bird feeder and filled it up with seed and you've been successful. A lot of people like it from the do-it-yourself kind of landscaping backyard renovation standpoint. And then lastly, and this is really what connects with Riverwood, a lot of people love birds because it makes them feel connected with nature. That birds really are the canary in the coal mine that help us understand our environment and what's going on with the weather and what's going on in our neighborhood. And so a lot of people love to connect with birds because it helps them really understand nature and what's going on with the environment around them. And then lastly, I thought this was a really interesting point to make. It's just that in Canada, if you haven't already noticed, nature is a big part of our culture. We have a maple leaf on our flag. The Blue Jay is the emblem of our Major League Baseball team. We're famous for the moose and the beaver and the loon. And so really birds and nature are a big part of being Canadian. And if you're someone who's a new Canadian who's just moved to this country, getting involved with bird feeding is a great way to learn about our culture and to learn about our history and our landscape. Interestingly enough, it actually is Britain and the UK that bird watching and bird feeding come from. So you'll notice in the UK, Ireland, Canada, Australia, America, bird feeding and bird watching is very popular. But if you maybe are immigrating here from a different part of the world, bird watching and bird feeding might be very foreign to you. So it's very much a Canadian UK based hobby. And it's something that's been a part of our culture for several decades, if not hundreds of years. So then specifically birding at home and with these stats, I'm talking about bird feeding. I just wanted to share a couple of things with you that are quite interesting. There are studies that show that actually one in two, almost 50% of Canadians have fed the birds at some point in their life. Maybe when it was with a child, but regardless, there's about 50% of us that have been born and raised here have fed the birds at some point. And it's a really amazing hobby that has many benefits for you and for anybody that might live with you. And I just wanted to go through a couple of them. So one of the, the main benefits of bird feeding, and you'll notice it right now if you're working from home, it's really entertaining. If you put a bird feeder right by your window, you're going to have constant entertainment with new species and colors and birds doing really funny, cute things. Um, it's just something that really kind of just breaks up the monotony of your day when you can look out your backyard and you can see wildlife up close. As well, bird feeding is actually really affordable. If you're like me and you don't have a pet, you don't have a cat or a dog, your wild birds can be your pets. And it's much more affordable to feed the wild birds than it would be to maintain a pet. And so it's something that, I mean, it's all based on your price point and what you wanna do, but it's a very affordable hobby to keep bird feeders full in your backyard. As well, something that's really interesting and Riverwood and also some organizations I'll talk about at the end, like Birds Canada, they get involved with this. You can be a citizen scientist when you feed the birds. And what that means is if you have your own feeder, you actually can track research and observations about what you see and submit it to some of these larger conservation groups. And it actually helps them learn more about bird populations and how birds are doing in Canada. So you actually get to take part and be someone who's part of the the movement to conserve birds and conserve nature when you have feeders in your backyard. And then lastly, bird feeding is great for people of all ages, especially the young and the elderly. If you have a small child at home or if you have a grandchild, bird feeding is amazing because it really helps them 
practice their language skills, identify colors, identify sounds. It helps them learn about nature. It helps them care about nature and see how nature is connected with us. And so bird feeding is a great hobby to introduce your kids or your grandkids or if you're a teacher to introduce your classroom to. But on the other end of the spectrum, for people who are not so young, bird feeding is an amazing hobby. If you have an elderly parent or grandparent or you yourself are you know, in your senior years and maybe you live on your own, um, bird feeding is a great way for you to feel like you have company and also it keeps your brain sharp, it keeps your body moving when you go outside or even if you're in a retirement home, it's very easy to set up a bird feeder outside of someone's window for them so that they have some connection with nature even if they can't get outside. So lots of reasons to feed the birds. Hopefully that's some of these reasons are why you're here today. And last but not least, if you are in Southern Ontario, if you're in the GTA, we are so lucky because there's so many beautiful birds that not only are here, but they're here year round. And so that's what I wanted to get into a little bit. There's, there's more information and research that you can do. And I'm, I'm gonna give you some links at the end that you can look up to learn more about these birds. But I just wanted to identify some of the most popular and most iconic birds that are local to Canada, but especially to the GTA, and just give you a little bit of information about each one, help you learn their name, and just see what they look like. So starting in our top left, we have the Blue Jay, as we've already talked about, very iconic bird. It's the name of our baseball team here in Canada, and it's very easy to spot. It literally is a Blue Jay. Jays almost look like a crow or a raven. It's actually a fairly large bird when you see it up close and very striking blue and white, um, this top along their head and they're called a blue jay. So that's a pretty easy one. Moving over to the right, we have the Northern Cardinal. And a lot of people don't know that is its technical name. So when people talk about cardinals, the Northern Cardinal is the same thing. But I wanted to I, I show you this. Um, on, on the left and the right, I have two different photos. And that's because often with not all birds, but um, especially with the cardinal, the male and the female can look sometimes very different from each other. But if you look up close, you'll see that those two birds are actually very similar, similar bill, similar body shape. But the female is the one that has the much more muted brown and red colors, while the male is the one that's that striking, famous bright red. And there's evolutionary reasons for this, that essentially males tend to be brighter in color for mating and breeding purposes, where females tend to be muted in colors basically it's for their own protection often when they're looking after their young and when they're looking after a nest. So then looking down, it's the same story with the American goldfinch. The American goldfinch, very iconic bird, one of the top birds that people are looking to attract in the spring and the summer. But a lot of people don't know, the male and the female do look different. And so the male is the one that's on the left, that's the bright yellow with the black on the head and the wings. And then the female to the right, more muted yellowy brown color, and she doesn't have that patch of black on her forehead. The other thing to note about American goldfinches, these are not migratory, board, migratory birds necessarily in southern Ontario. So the blue jay, the cardinal, and the goldfinch will be found in southern Ontario year-round, but what happens with the goldfinch is that they actually molt or they shed their feathers, and so in the winter time even the males become dark, a little bit of a darker muted yellow, but it's in the spring, particularly in May, that you start to see them becoming this bright yellow. And so a lot of people notice goldfinches more in the spring, but actually if you live in the GTA, goldfinches are here year round, but they're very iconic in the spring because of the bright yellow males. And then lastly on this slide, I wanna draw your attention to what's on the bottom left, and that's the purple finch. And I put a little asterisk there because the purple finch can be local to Southern Ontario, but it is a bird that's known to migrate, especially in the fall, sometimes east, east to west across Canada in search of food. But this is technically a bird that you could spot year round. And the purple finch, just like its name, it literally looks like a little finch that's been dunked in pink purple dye. It's very, very striking when you see one, it's purple from head to toe. And it's a bird that in the GTA that you actually have a very good chance of seeing that will come to a backyard bird feeder. Continuing on, just a couple other species that I also wanted to point out to you. Top left, this should be a bird that you might already know. It's the black capped chickadee. The reason why the chickadee is called a chickadee is actually because it makes a call. One of its sounds is literally a sound that sounds like chickadee, chickadee dee dee, chickadee. So that's very easy to remember. And if you hear that sound, that is the chickadee bird, and that's where its name comes from. And what's really interesting about chickadees is that they're very friendly. 
And when it comes to human interaction, you actually can feed them from the palm of your hand. And that's something that very famously you can actually do at Riverwood. You could go to some of their bird hiking trails and put some bird seed in your hands and a tiny little chickadee will come and eat out of the palm of your hand. So chickadees are delightful birds and they do also frequent backyard bird feeders. One of the most popular birds that comes to people's bird feeders and they're actually found coast to coast across Canada year round. Then moving over to the right, I wanted to show you a couple different woodpeckers. There's a bunch of different species of woodpeckers that are found in Canada, but this one in the center, the downy woodpecker, that's actually the most popular woodpecker that people find in Canada at their feeder. Very, actually, when you see it up close, it's a very small bird. That photo is a little bit deceiving. They're actually quite petite. And the downy has a very small head and a small little beak. And it has very striking, luscious black and white feathers. And the males will have a, a spot of red on the back of their heads, but the females will not. And then on the right, I wanted to show you this one. This, this woodpecker can actually be slightly frightening. It's very large when you see it in person, quite large. That's the pileated woodpecker. And if you're someone who's going up north to cottage country this summer, the pileated woodpecker is a woodpecker that potentially that you might spot in the trees or at someone's suet feeder. And then lastly for our species that I wanted to cover, I want to talk about the Baltimore Oriole and the rose-breasted grosbeak. These are actually two of the most popular birds that people want to see in the spring and the summer. And that's because these are migratory birds. So the chickadee and the woodpecker, those are found in GTA and across Canada year round, but the Oriole and the grosbeak are migrants. They only come up here starting in May throughout the spring and the summer, and then they return south of the border. And but luckily, again, in the GTA, you can see this bird and maybe you already have. So with the rose-breasted grosbeak, same story with the cardinal and the goldfinch, the males and the females look actually incredibly different. It's the males that have that rose red and white breast and the black body. It's the females that are almost the complete opposite in coloring with that very muted brown, but you'll notice that the beak and the shape of the bird is very similar. And fun fact, gross beak basically comes from the French translation of gros bec, meaning big beak. And when you see a gross beak up close, you'll notice that they have a much more substantial beak and head than a finch would. And then lastly, on the left, we have the Baltimore Oriole, very iconic with its bright orange belly. It also is uh, connected to a baseball team. And uh, the Baltimore Oriole is something that you're only going to see in the spring when it migrates. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but it's a little bit not trickier, but they won't typically come to your backyard bird feeders. You have to kind of put out some other products potentially if you want to draw one in close, but Baltimore Orioles are definitely a bird that you can see right now in the GTA. So I hope that was helpful and not necessarily boring, just something to kind of get your head in the right space about why do we feed birds and why is this a very interesting hobby. And so now we're going to get into some of the meat and potatoes of how to actually attract birds. And so there's five steps that I want to walk you through. So the first piece, and this is what maybe a lot of people don't realize, is that how your yard looks, how much landscaping and gardening and nature and vegetation you have does go a long way in attracting the birds. That doesn't mean if you live in an apartment or a condo or a small little town home that you still can't see the birds, but having nature and vegetation does a lot to bring them in. And so if you can do your part to try to add landscaping and gardening to your home, or hopefully you can take advantage maybe of some nature and landscaping that your neighbors have or that's on the street that you live, that will go a long way in your efforts to draw in birds. So what do we mean by that? Well, for one thing, trees and shrubs are actually very important for birds. And there's several reasons why. One would be, and you notice this a lot in the winter weather when it gets colder, trees and shrubs like a cedar or a spruce, they provide a lot of protection for birds. You'll actually will see them starting to flock and hide in something like a cedar tree, basically to help them cut out the wind and the snow and the cold. So it actually is very important to have dense foliage and shrubbery for birds to be able to get away, especially in the cold weather. But as well, right now in the spring and the summer months, it's very important for birds to have protection when they're nesting because it's quite common for other birds to try to attack their nest and it's very important for them to have it in a safe spot. So you will notice birds taking advantage of a tree that allows them to have some hiding and have some cover. And so if you put out that type of foliage in your yard, there's a good chance you're gonna attract birds in the spring and the summer because they're nesting around your home. And then lastly, this is something that's very important. A lot of people think that if they start feeding the birds that they're almost, um, 
changing wildlife in a bad way and that the wildlife won't be able to adapt, that it's going to become used to your feeder and not be able to adapt to the wild anymore. And that's not the case. Whenever birds come to a bird feeder, that is never their only food source. Birds always have a bunch of different food sources in their area that they're constantly checking up on. And some of them will be backyard feeders, but a lot of their food comes from the natural food supply. And so actually, birds find a lot of their food in the spring and the summer through fruit and nuts and insects. And so something that you can do is plant trees and shrubs, things like service berries, dogwoods, different types of species that actually produce fruit and nuts in the spring and the summer. And that's what you see there on the top right. That's a cedar waxwing bird that's eating some berries that they were able to find off someone's tree. That will do a lot to bring birds closer to your home as well. Things like thistle and milkweed, those also become a food source for birds. So if you have those types of vegetation in your yard, you're going to be drawing birds in. And then lastly, when it comes to flowers, this is very important if you're trying to attract hummingbirds. And so that, I don't get into that too much in this, in this presentation, but hummingbirds are definitely something that people like to attract into their yard. And something naturally that you can do to bring in hummingbirds is that you can plant flowers, particularly ones that are cone-shaped. And there's a lot of good resources online where you can Google and search for the best flowers to attract hummingbirds, but essentially something that's very cone-shaped where hummingbirds can, can get nectar that will bring hummingbirds into your yard as well. So nature and vegetation, tree shrubs and flowers. The second step would also be to provide a water source. And again, a lot of people might not realize this, but birds, they also need to drink water for their own health. But as well with birds, it's actually very important for them to have water so that they can clean off their feathers. And so if you are able to provide a water source in your yard, again, that's another added thing that you're doing to try to attract birds into your yard. And the great thing about water sources is that you can do them in all different types of shapes and sizes and price points. I know me, I have a cheap little $20, $20 water fountain that I have that's on my porch and I've actually seen birds come to that water fountain on my porch to clean off. If you have more money and time and you have a bigger yard, you could actually build your own custom pond that has a running water feature with a fountain but as well, it's very famous that you can also provide a still water source for the birds, like a bird bath that you keep filled. And then interestingly enough, you actually can purchase heated bird baths for the wintertime. And that's what that one photograph is showing you there in the center. Because in the wintertime, birds still need water to drink and clean off. But because of colder temperatures, water will freeze. So you actually can purchase heated bird baths that will mount to your bath porch or your back deck and that allows you to break up the water to keep it still and liquid for the birds to drink and for the birds to clean off. And at the very end there, I just included the, the biggest benefit of adding a water source is also all of the other types of wildlife that you might attract, in particular ducks. You might find that a lot of ducks are coming to your yard to nest or to also clean off and have a drink if you bring water into your yard. So bird food. So this is kind of the meat and potatoes. This is what I know uh, a, a bit best with my, my, my line of work. And so I wanted to just give you a little bit of a rundown about bird food, some of the tips and tricks, the best things for you to know. And obviously, if you have more questions, we can cover some more topics about this in the Q&A. But basically, bird food is agriculture products. And a lot of bird food that we produce is sourced out of Canada or the USA, but there's a lot of these ingredients are actually part of our Canadian agriculture. So you really are actually supporting your local Canadian farmer and you're, su you're supporting the Canadian economy when you purchase bird food. And essentially there are a bunch of different ingredients out there that attract birds, that birds enjoy. And I wanted to give you the inside scoop by actually showing you five of the most popular, five of the most successful, five of the, five of the best ingredients for birds. And that would be black oil sunflower seed, peanuts, white millet, niger, and safflower seed. And so I won't go into too much technical detail or too much detail about these, but essentially um, the big thing is that birds don't actually have taste buds. So when they are eating bird food or when they're eating anything, they're not going for the flavor, so to speak, like you and I do, but they actually look for the nutritional content. So a lot of these ingredients are great for birds because they're high in fat, they're high in protein, they provide a lot of energy content for birds. And so that's why some of these ingredients are better than others. 
So starting off with black oil sunflower seed, that number one there on the screen, black oil sunflower seed is the most famous and the most popular ingredient to use to feed birds. It'll attract a wide variety of birds. And the really neat thing about sunflower is that you can purchase it in different forms. You can buy black oil sunflower with the black shell on. You also can buy black oil sunflower seed that has the shell off and that's cut up into finer pieces. And that's really appealing to people that are big into gardening and maybe don't want some of the weeds and the mess that sunflower produce. You can still get all the benefits of sunflower without the shells and without the weeds. But overall, sunflower is a very popular ingredient that attracts a wide variety of birds. Moving on to number two is peanuts. A lot of people probably know that peanuts are attracted to the birds. They're also attracted to squirrels. And so we'll talk about that if that's a problem for you. Um, but peanuts also come in different shapes and sizes. You can get peanuts in the shell that almost look like the edible kind that you and I would eat and crack open. But you can also purchase peanuts essentially with the shell taken off and chopped up into finer pieces. Moving on to number three, we have white millet, which really is an agriculture commodity product, but it's very popular to a wide variety of birds. Then number four, we have niger seed. You probably have heard of niger seed. It's also a very famous popular seed to attract birds, in particular finches in the springtime. And niger seed, actually fun fact, it's not grown in Canada or the US. It's typically sourced from Ethiopia or India. It comes a long way across the ocean to get to us here in Canada to use, but it's very popular and a very tried and true staple to attract finches. And then lastly, we have safflower seed. And so safflower seed, if you can see that there on the screen, I think you can. That's number five. And it basically looks like a black oil sunflower seed, um, but with a white shell. And safflower seed is an ingredient that attracts really beautiful birds, but it's actually less appealing to squirrels and blackbirds and crows. So then as far as how bird food is packaged, you essentially can either pick one ingredient and stick with it. So for example, here at Armstrong's, we package black oil sunflower seed, and you could just buy that on your own. But also different companies out there like us will create blends for you that purposely have customized a blend based on the birds that we know it will attract the best. And we have only those ingredients in the blend and it's already mixed and done for you. And so for example, that sweet songs there would have black oil, safflower, niger, peanuts, white millet. So it has all the ingredients ready to go for you to use. There's also other types of products that are not just bird seeds. You can purchase what you see there at the bottom. That's an example of a bird seed treat. So you can actually purchase treats that essentially have the seeds stuck together with gelatin. And then it's something that you can hang on a tree branch that you don't need a bird feeder to use. And then on the bottom there, we also have something that's called a suet cake. And a suet cake is incredibly popular in the winter time. It's essentially liquid beef fat that's been mixed with grain. And again, it has a lot of fat, a lot of energy content. And so, and so suet is a very cheap and easy to use product that's very effective in the colder weather months. And the thing to keep in mind is not all birds enjoy the same ingredients. And so when you look at some of these bird food products, a lot of these companies will help you out by actually having pictures of the birds on the product that it's supposed to attract. Um, so for example, a cardinal, they love black oil and safflower. Blue jays, they love peanuts in the shell and corn. Finches love niger and sunflower chips. So there really is a science behind what ingredients birds like best. So if you're trying to attract a particular bird, it's good to do the research and I'll show you some websites at the end that you can use to help you out. But if you really want to attract a particular bird, you really should research what its favorite ingredients are and either put that ingredient out in your feeder or look for blends that have them. And then if you're looking to buy bird food, where can you find it? Well, lucky for you in Canada, you can pretty much find it anywhere. Your big box stores like Canadian Tire and Walmart, they have a bird food section. Garden centers have bird food sections. Hardware stores like Home Hardware, Home Depot, they carry bird feed. Pet stores like a Pet Smart or a Pet Value or your local pet shop will likely have bird seed. And usually it's either in the garden area or the seasonal section or in the pet supply section. But just go to your local store or look online. We also sell on Amazon and a bunch of different bird food companies sell on Amazon. Um, so just go to your local store and ask them. And if you're in store in person, they should be able to help you find the section where the bird food is kept. 
And then one last thing to note about bird food is that there also are things that work well for birds that are not just seeds and grains. So going back to that Baltimore Oriole, and that's what you'll see there on the bottom, Baltimore Orioles, they might sometimes come to your bird feeder, but typically they're not attracted to seeds and grains. What Baltimore Orioles love the best are oranges and other types of fruit, jam and jelly, they'll like nectar. And so you can actually just put out slices of oranges to attract birds like a Baltimore Oriole into your yard, or you can put some grape jelly in a little dish in a container outside, and that will do the trick to attract some of those birds as well. You also can purchase something like dried insects, because again, birds like insects. So in the summertime, you can try to put out your own food source of that and put it in a dish outside. And then hummingbird is a little bit of a different story, but you can either purchase hummingbird nectar or you can actually make nectar on your own by mixing sugar and water together. So that, that is kind of in a nutshell, some of the best practices with bird food. It really is all about the right ingredient for the right bird. There are some ingredients that have been tried and true and proven to work the best because of their nutritional content. And you can either purchase them on their own in blends or look for suets and treats or try things like oranges and jelly and insects. And essentially you can find bird seed almost anywhere and you can get it online now, which is really easy and convenient. And just remember that every bird has its own preference. And so if you're not attracting the birds you wanna see, you might have to change up the ingredients that you're using. So I hope you're still with me. Uh, the next major tip is about bird feeders. And this is really where I think a lot of people get stuck is that it's one thing to pick out a bird food product that seems interesting. It's another thing to actually know how to use it. And I do think a lot of people's problem is that they might be using the wrong bird feeder. There's, there's no really such thing as the wrong bird feeder, but sometimes the bird seed you're trying to use might not match well with either the, the, the bird feeder that you have or also with the types of birds that are coming to that bird feeder. So I just wanted to walk you through a little bit of the basics of bird feeders and show you some of the different styles and talk about the pros and cons. There really is no such thing as a bad bird feeder, but it's really up to you, your price point, what you think looks attractive in your yard, and ultimately what type of features and benefits that you want the feeder to have. So the big difference is that each bird feeder has different size holes. And so it's going to accommodate different sizes of seeds. And you might have noticed that on that photo back here, there's larger seeds like black oil sunflower seeds or peanuts are fairly large, but something like a Niger seed is actually very, very fine. And so with that in mind, some of these bird feeders might have holes that are way too big and not appropriate for Niger seed, or some of them might have holes that are too small and peanuts won't fit through them or sunflower seeds won't fit through them. So that really is kind of the heart of the issue. And then as well, there's larger birds and there's smaller birds. And so different feeders are going to accommodate different sizes of birds. So here are a few different shapes and styles, the platform, the hopper, the tube, and the cage. So a platform feeder is what you see there in the top left. It essentially is a flat rectangular surface that literally is a platform. And you can either hang it from above or it usually has a stake where you could put it in the ground. You kind of have two different ways to hang it. And essentially the platform gives you one big large service, service to just dump all your bird seed on. And so a platform is very, very functional because you can use large and small seeds. It also allows a large variety of birds to congregate all at once. You could easily have a dozen birds or even more than that eating on a platform feeder all at one time. So it really gives you a, access to a lot of birds and the flexibility to use really big seeds. However, a platform feeder is obviously exposed to the elements. And I have a platform feeder in my backyard and that's what happened last night. We had a really big rainstorm and all that bird seed got completely drenched. And at that point, you really should change it out when it's become that soaking wet. And so that can be one of the downsides of a platform feeder, especially when it's rainy in the summer or in the winter time when there's lots of precipitation. So there's pros and cons, but the fact that a platform feeder is exposed to the environment would be one of the big downsides. Uh, and then going over one more, we have the hopper feeder. And so that's what has the black roof. A hopper feeder is kind of similar to a platform feeder. It has some big wider openings at the bottom that you can see. Um, but in this case, a hopper feeder has a roof. So it gives you a little bit more rain and weather protection. But similar to a platform feeder, it lets you use bigger seeds. And it has very wide openings where a large amount of birds could all feed at the same time. 
Then as we look down, we have a tube feeder. And I showed you two examples there, the yellow and the red of two different types of tube feeders, where tube feeders are really beneficial and they have advantages over platform and hopper is particularly when it comes to finches. So something like a Niger seed, again, is very, very fine. And Niger is most appropriately fed in a proper finch feeder. And that's what you see there in the yellow. So if you can look closely, that finch feeder has very tiny holes that are essentially custom built just for a Niger seed to come out of. And so that really is the best thing for a finch to be able to feed off of. It also has perches that allow the finch to hang upright or upside down to eat. So it's a very fun feeding experience for the finches. And the big advantage of that would be, in this case, you're really targeting the bird that you wanna see. So if you're having grackles and crows come to your bird feeder and you're not enjoying it, it's very hard to stop a crow from getting on a platform feeder or a hopper feeder, but a crow is gonna be deterred from a finch feeder because the holes are too small and the feeder is not set up for them to properly cling. And so in this case, a tube feeder sometimes can narrow the birds that you see, but that might be what you're looking for. And then the big advantage that a tube feeder has over something like a platform feeder is that it's totally enclosed. And so that really does keep the seed protected from the wind and the rain and the snow. And then moving over one, we have this red tube feeder and it's very similar in concept, but you'll notice that the holes are bigger. So something like this would feed black oil sunflower seed or peanut halves, and it will allow slightly bigger birds than just finches to feed. Um, so that would be one advantage of going one step up with a larger tube feeder. And then the cage would, what, would be what you would see in the top right, and so that's actually a suet cage feeder. And so that allows you to take a suet cake and be able to hang it. And this is a nifty cage feeder there that actually has a roof that gives it a little bit of durability when it comes to wind and rain and snow and it's very light and easy to hang. You essentially just open up the cage to take the suet cake in and out, uh, very functional and also very affordable. And so ultimately, the, the major factors that come into your buying decision would be price point. You can find feeders that are as cheap as $15, $20 to ones that cost almost $200. It really depends on what you're looking for as far as features, as far as material, as far as how aesthetic that they look. Um, something like that red feeder there would be a plastic tube feeder that's actually very affordable, probably in the $20 price range. And it actually would be able to last for several years and be very easy to clean. But you might want to do something that's in metal, that's in copper, that has more advanced features. So that really is up to you. And that's one of the feeders that I have here on the screen. I believe that you can see it here. It's um, that squirrel proof feeder. So it's actually the third one from the left at the bottom. So that actually is a little bit more of an expensive feeder, but it's more expensive because it actually has features in it that would prevent a squirrel from being able to get at the seed. The body of the feeder essentially collapses, preventing a squirrel from getting inside. So that's a really nifty feeder that you can purchase if you're willing to spend a little bit more money on a feeder that has some extra features. And then lastly, some bird food ingredients don't require a feeder at all. Again, if you want to put out orange slices or you want to put out jelly to attract the Baltimore Oriole, you don't necessarily need a bird feeder for that. And then lastly, just wrapping up here, um, we have placement, storage, and maintenance. So really, if you want to feed the birds successfully, there are some tips and tricks that you can use to make your bird feeder work the best, depending on where you put it. And there also are some best practices to try to keep your bird seed fresh and last the longest. So when it comes to feeder placement, if you have never feed the birds before, you really need to be patient. You, you will need to give yourself several weeks for the birds to get used to that feeder being in your backyard. But there are some things you can do to try to help the birds recognize your feeder. So one of them would be to actually put your bird feeder where you notice that the birds are. So if you see birds congregating in a tree because they're nesting or they've just migrated and they're taking a rest stop in your backyard, consider putting your bird feeder out there to get them used to your bird feeder. And then over time, you can maybe start to adjust where you place it once you know that the birds know that you're there. As well, it is a good idea to try to put bird feeders near your window so that you can see them and that you can enjoy them. But there are some tips and tricks we'd recommend. 
we actually say for the safety of birds, it's very important that you put bird feeders three feet or closer to your window because window collisions can happen when birds fly into your window and they can be killed by that experience. And so you wanna do everything you can to try to make sure the birds don't get confused. So putting the bird feeder either within three feet or further than 30 feet away, that's that three versus 30 rule that keeps the birds safe, but also allows you to enjoy the birds. And then there's different accessories that you can purchase. Um, if you're trying to deter squirrels, there's things like squirrel baffles that's there on the screen that actually you can put below or above your feeder to try to prevent them from climbing up. There's shepherd hooks and poles that you can put in the ground to hang your feeder off of. You also can make use of tree branches and limbs to try to hang your feeder, but if you don't have those, a shepherd's pole and a hook goes a long way to help you hang your feeder. There's things you can put at the bottom of your feeder to try to catch seed from falling to the ground. There's totes that you can use to carry your seed up to your feeder. Um, and then when it comes to storage, something that's very important is that you put your bird feed in a location where rodents and pests are not going to get into it. And so if you're storing your bird seed in your garage, we still would highly recommend that you actually put that bird seed in a lid that has a, a, a container with a lid that can lock or seal tightly because you will get rodents or even squirrels sometimes trying to bust into your garage to try to get at your bird seed. And ultimately we would, we would highly recommend that you never store bird seed in your home because it does have the potential to attract moss and different types of insects. So we would highly recommend that you always put your bird seed outside in a garage or a shed if possible. And then when you do put it in its own container with a lid to keep it safe. And then interestingly enough, a lot of bird seed products actually have a two year shelf life. So don't feel like if you purchase them that you have to use them right away, that they're going to expire or go bad. And then our very last tip would be that with your bird feeders, that you always do keep them clean. Ideally every two weeks, but if not once a month, give your bird feeders a clean with warm water, soap, and bleach. So there you have it. Those are some of the tips we have for you about feeding the birds. We're now here to do question and answer. And you will see here on the screen, I've left you a couple links to some different organizations we'd recommend to help you learn more. Um, there's all about birds, Birds Canada, Feeder Watch. They all have really great information about bird species, what you can do to help conserve birds and how you can learn more about what bird foods they like the best. There's also something really cool called the Merlin Bird App that you can download and put on your smartphone that actually will help you identify a bird that you're looking at. And then we at Armstrong, we have a website and we're here to help you if you have any questions and you can check us out on social media uh, and engage with us online. Wonderful, Sarah, thank you so much for that extensive and very informative presentation. Uh, just covered pretty much everything uh, about bird feeding and uh, I learned a whole lot along the way. One thing I will say uh, on the chickadee call, our conservation specialist taught me that you can identify it by the sound of a uh, cheeseburger, ah, cheeseburger. So, yes. uh, so now I associate uh, chickadees with cheeseburgers. So, <laughs> so thanks to our conservation specialist for that. Uh, and again, thanks to everyone for uh, joining us today for our presentation. We will get to your questions now. Uh, and if you have any more uh, as we go along through the Q&A session, uh, please drop them into the Q&A panel. So the first one uh, comes from, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Asia or Aisa who's eight years old, and her question is, where do you find the Northern Cardinal? And what was the name of the last bird in the slide where you showed the Northern Cardinal? So I don't know if you wanna go back a few slides to where you had the Northern Cardinal up on screen uh, and figure out what was that last bird on there. And also where would be a good place to find uh, a Northern Cardinal? That's a very good question. Um, and so maybe if she can type maybe what bird she's referring to other than the Northern Cardinal. That might've been the purple mm -hmm. finch at the bottom that she was talking about. But um, a Northern Cardinal, it's found right here in Southern Ontario um, year round. The trick with the Northern Cardinal, sadly, our friends in the West Coast do not see it. The Northern Cardinal does not really venture into Alberta or BC. Um, it's basically as far West as maybe Saskatchewan, but really it's Southern Ontario, and then into Quebec in the Maritimes that see the Northern Cardinal. And really it's a very common bird that you see in your backyards. A lot of people have Northern Cardinals that nest. Um, the really cute thing is that the male and the female Cardinals, they pair up and they actually mate for life, that they 
science shows that they actually remain a, a pair for their whole life. And so you'll often see one male and one female close by in people's backyards for nesting, but actually cedar trees have been known to be a good nesting spot for northern cardinals. So if you have cedar trees or maybe your neighbor does, look closely. And the other thing, northern cardinals have a very distinctive call. It actually sounds like a high pitch chink, chink, chink. And so often if you hear that chinking, pay attention and look, you might be able to see a male or a female cardinal nearby, but they actually are very common and they tend to nest in people's backyards. Uh, so next question, um, you mentioned it uh, a little bit in terms of the anti-squirrel feeder, uh, but how do you keep squirrels at bay? Is there, are there any other options besides the feeder itself, which uh, make it a little bit harder for squirrels to get to the, to the bird food? Yep, very good question. Um, I'll just flip back through some of these slides here. So yes, the trick with squirrels, and again, some people love squirrels and they want to feed them, but the trick is a lot of these ingredients here on the screen, squirrels enjoy. In particular, they love black oil sunflower, they love peanuts, they also love corn. Um, and so there's a few different ways you can approach this. The one thing you can do, people, some people have the mindset that if you can't eat them, join them. And so if you give squirrels their own food source, they might leave your bird seed alone. So in particular, putting out peanuts in the shell in a certain spot, they really like that ingredient. So you could try just putting out peanuts in the shell, maybe on your, your back step or on your sidewalk and see if they come there instead. Um, but if that's not the route that you wanna go, there's really a few different options that you can do. My, my best recommendation to you probably would be to invest in a squirrel proof feeder. And that's what one of these is here on the screen at the bottom that you see there. The, um, silvery color feeder. So that literally, if a heavy squirrel tries to land on it, the body of the feeder is going to lock and the holes will not be accessible. Also, the perches will collapse with the weight of a squirrel, but a bird will be able to rest on it no problem. And then the top of the feeder is very difficult to get into. So that really would be your best bet to have at least one dedicated feeder that has some squirrel-proof features. But other things you can do, um, position your feeder in a place where the, the squirrels can't easily jump on it. So if possible, if you can put your bird feeder literally in no man's land in your backyard where there's no garage, no shed, no trees where they can try to jump on it, that makes it very difficult for them to climb. That's not always easy for everyone, but if you put it in a spot where it's difficult for them to even land on it would be one thing. You also can purchase some of the, uh, here it is here, the squirrel baffles. They go a long way to prevent them from climbing up the pole. I also have a lot of success. I just have a slinky. I took a regular slinky and I actually wrapped it around my bird feeder pole and that actually prevents the squirrels from being able to climb up. It's actually oh. pretty funny to watch that <laughs> the bird feeder pole. I've seen that be done. Um, but then the other thing that I would mention, sorry, I'm flipping, flipping around here. Um, there are some bird food ingredients though that squirrels don't like. So in particular, that safflower, those white seeds, Squirrels will eat it if they're desperate, but they actually really don't like safflower. But cardinals love it, rose-breasted grosbeaks do, chickadees do. So you could try to go for a bird food ingredient like that or niger seed. Niger seed finches love it, but squirrels aren't that interested in it. So you could also and or try to switch up the bird food ingredients. So really I'd say a, a squirrel-proof feeder, some different features on your bird feeder pole, putting your bird feeder in a place where they can't jump on it and then trying to use some ingredients that the squirrels don't like the best. Or just give them their own food and, and, and give up, but try to make them go away from your bird feeder. Just keep them separate from the rest of the birds. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the, the niger seeds, and uh, also you did touch on this uh, at one point during your presentation, is you know, when we do have a heavy downpour and if the bird food is exposed to the elements uh, and it does get wet after a downpour, should that seed just be thrown away or will birds still kind of come back to it even if it's mushy and maybe not the most appeal? Birds will still potentially come to it. I think you kind of have to have a judgment call with that and play it by ear to see are the birds kind of staying away from it the next day. But the main thing would be potentially if the bird seed goes moldy or goes rancid in some way because of it also really warm weather can sometimes do that especially if you sue it. So kind of playing it by ear but we probably would recommend especially if it's been on a platform feeder like mine where it got totally soaked that you just want to change it out and that's where it is sometimes important to look at the weather forecast and when you know that a big storm is coming in the summertime try to put some of your bird feeders down especially the ones that you're really worried about getting damaged just bring it inside overnight or put it in your garage and then try again the next day sometimes storms pop up and we don't we don't see them coming or we're not home but 
it would be ideal if you could try to put your feeders out of harm's way when a storm comes. Okay. Uh, next question about grackles um, being, I guess, uh, one that could potentially monopolize a feeder and maybe keep some of the other birds away. Uh, is it bad for the feeder environment uh, to have grackles there? No. And I mean, some people enjoy grackles. That's the thing. Sometimes we get in trouble when we talk about nuisance birds because some people don't think they're a nuisance. They think they're very attractive birds. Um, so it's very similar advice to what we say about squirrels, that there's certain ingredients like niger seed and safflower that grackles or crows will not enjoy as much. And so if you're trying to not have them around, you could try to switch to those types of ingredients. Or like I talked about, you could try to switch to some of the bird feeders that are harder for them to climb on. But really, I mean, birds have to survive in the wild and compete with different species. You'll actually notice the biggest jerk on the block is actually the blue jay. The blue jay is very famous for being a bit of a disturber and they actually will make a call that sounds like a hawk to try to scare the other birds away. And yet they're this lovable creature that everyone enjoys, but they're actually can be a bit of a, a mean bird from our perspective when you're watching them. So, I mean, birds are smart. You'll watch them when the crows, the grackles come, they fly away and then the more innocent little birds come back when the, when the scarier, bigger birds are gone. So I'd say no, it's just kind of part of the ebb and the flow, but there are things you could do to try to make the grackles or crows go away. Okay, before we get to the next question, can I ask you, Sarah, to just bring up the last slide that you had, uh, just so we show those uh, websites again, because that was one of the questions actually that we had. Uh, so yeah, some more informative sites for people to go to uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, next question. Um, we mentioned uh, some of the products like uh, sunflowers, peanuts that birds like. Uh, is it good or it, along the same lines to just use the same stuff that you'd find at a grocery store or do they need to come in kind of a different variety like uh, in the actual pre-mixed bird food packages that are available? It's actually a very good question. I don't have the research to know to compare how effective they are. Um, all I can do is the ingredients we use, the main difference is it's not human grade. So when we have peanuts that we receive, it's basically only human edible rejects. And that's the same thing on the, on the black oil sunflower side. So uh, I really wouldn't know specifically the difference between sunflower that people eat and the sunflower that we have. But I would say on the peanut side, I would say it would be somewhat similar. I think the, the question would just be almost like what's more cost effective for you? And if you actually were to check it out and see what's more cost effective, the peanuts that are human grade or the peanuts that are the ones in the bird food section, I would highly suspect that the, the bird food variety would be cheaper from a price point perspective just because it's not the human grade that's used for human nutrition. Um, but I really can't answer that question completely because I don't know the difference between the sunflowers that people eat and the sunflower that we have, but it'd be interesting. To see the difference. Maybe do a little uh, A/B testing and see which uh, which one gets uh, more of the uh, attention from the birds in your in your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, next question, along the lines of uh, again the the pests that are around, not so much grackles this time, but uh, other rodents that might be around the bird feeders, uh, picking up the scraps that may come to the ground. Is there any way to prevent rodents from eating that bird seed, either on the feeder itself or down on the ground once it falls? Again, ingredients play a big role. Um, raccoons or rats will be very drawn to things like corn or things like black oil, I do believe, but especially corn is a famous ingredient that people sometimes have in their bird seed that can attract things like raccoons and rats. Um, so again, trying to adjust the ingredients you use would be one approach. Um, also doing what you can to try to keep your bird feeder, the ground underneath it clean. And there actually are things you can purchase that are almost like a bird feeder catcher that will try to catch some of the seed that falls. Um, or some people you'll notice they'll even put um, patio stones or concrete underneath their bird feeder so they can easily wipe it away and sweep it away and keep it clean. Those would probably be my two best recommendations. And then looking at if they find that raccoons or, or rats are actually getting on your feeder same tips as with squirrels, adjusting potentially where they're located or the type of feeder that you have, so it's more difficult for them to climb onto it. And uh, so now we're in the middle of summer, or we're getting into summer now, and uh, food source is a little bit more abundant for birds out in the wild. So uh, a question, is it more important to feed birds in the winter instead of the summer? That's a very good question. And um, the short answer would be yes and no. 
Um, winter is one of the most popular times to feed the birds and you actually will see that on the news where different conservation groups encourage you to feed the birds when a big snowstorm is coming because it is true in the cold weather months because of the cold weather and the snow and the ice there is not the fruit and the nuts and the insects around for the birds and so they do rely more on bird feeders that they can that they can find. That's definitely true. Also in the fall and the early spring, because here in Canada we can still get snow in May. So um, definitely in the colder weather it is very important to feed the birds, but it also is very important to do it year-round and in the summer months. And we would say one of the main reasons why is because of nesting. You have parents that are trying to stay healthy to take care of their young, and then you have the young once they hatch that are um, beginning to grow up and feed. So there definitely will, would be need for nutrition in the summer months. And then also just, we look at it, it's, it's for you as well as for the birds and for the enjoyment for you to really appreciate them. There's some really beautiful birds like we mentioned, like that rose-breasted grosbeak or the Baltimore Oriole, and you're only going to see it really if you feed them in the spring and the summer and try to attract them into your yard. So we'd say bird feeding has a lot to do with you and your enjoyment and appreciating nature, um, but it definitely supports the bird for sure in the winter, but it also has a lot of benefits in the summer as well. And so, you know, throughout your presentation, you gave a number of uh, options aside from just the bird feeder, but the landscaping side of things uh, in terms of making your backyard or your yard a little bit more attractive to, to birds. So, and one question that we received was, uh, how can I attract birds to the feeder in the first place? Uh, is it a matter of, you know, just putting it out there and like you said, maybe giving it a couple of weeks for the birds to find out that the uh, food source is there? Uh, or are there other ways to make the feeder itself a little bit more attractive, uh, maybe other than, than the points that you brought up earlier in terms of landscaping? Well, actually, that's a really good question. And I actually don't quite know the answer as far as how attractive the feeder looks. I do know that's the case actually when it comes to hummingbird feeders. And I'll just briefly switch back here. You'll see that there is an example of a hummingbird feeder here on the right hand side. And there actually is some science behind that, that the hummingbirds are attracted to the hummingbird feeders that are red and white and, or yellow, and they actually do notice the flower shape that you see on a hummingbird feeder. I don't know if that's the case with bird feeders, like for example, if goldfinches see the yellow finch feeder, if they're attracted to that. I actually don't know that. I'll have to look up that question. Um, but yeah, sometimes it can be a tough go, especially if you've never fed birds before and you can get frustrated feeling like you're, you're trying to do all the right things and you're not seeing them. And, you know, sometimes it really could be the luck of the draw of what birds are visiting right now in your neighborhood and that take a notice of you. We would just encourage you to be patient, to continue to maybe try different locations to put your bird feeder out. Again, maybe trying to put it out along a fence line or trees where you've noticed that birds have been flocking. Um, and then also pay attention to certain times of the year. In May, May and also September are two big migratory months for birds and that's when you have a really good chance of seeing different birds that are flying in and out of the country and then especially then in the winter time when they're really cold so i think really trying to take advantage of some of the key times and seasons and something else that you can do and it is one of these resources that i'll put back up on the screen um, but if you look at birds canada and feeder watch they actually collect data about birds across canada and people submit their observations and so you actually could look up your postal code and look at your neighborhood and you could actually see what neighbors of yours are um, basically posting what birds that they're they're seeing and that could actually give you really your put your finger on the pulse of what birds are in your neighborhood or in your cul-de-sac and then you could try to almost tailor your bird feed according to that because you know that different people in the area are spotting chickadees i want to make sure that i put out good chickadee food so actually the feeder watch can really help you understand, are, are we just in a lull right now in my neighborhood? Is it just me? Um, you can actually look at some science and see real live data of birds that are in your neighborhood. Okay, uh, we've reached our time and uh, you've answered all the questions that came through. So Sarah, thank you again for a wonderful presentation and for your ability to answer all sorts of questions that were thrown at you today. And uh, we have a number of websites that, as you see up on the screen right now, I will give you one more. Uh, and of course, that's the riverwoodconservancy.org, uh, where you'll be able to find some of our past webinars, uh, some new blog articles that we've been posting that have lots of educational information uh, to keep kids busy for the next little while. And of course, we are still staying at home a lot longer than usual these days. So uh, a lot more content is up on our website right now at the riverwoodconservancy.org. And while you're there, if you have the financial means uh, to support us 
so that we can keep delivering webinars like this and all sorts of other virtual content and to get us uh, in good shape again when things are safe to reopen. Of course, we'd very much appreciate your donation at the riverwoodconservancy.org. So Sarah from Armstrong Bird Food, a wonderful presentation. Thank you again for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And for everyone joining today, thank you so much. Uh, please stay safe and we will see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye everyone.